people tell you, be present, be in the moment. And it's sweet, but it's an empty in the structure. Because when you're not in the moment, you're not there to know you're not there, right? So the way to be present is Harvard psychologist, Professor Ellen Langer. The mother of mindfulness. Everything is potentially new. Everything can be understood in multiple ways. Uncertainty is the rule. It's not the exception. We did research where we made people more mindful, older people. As a result of all, in just a week, their hearing improved, their vision improved, their strength, their memory, and they look young. If you ask chambermaids, do they get any exercise? They say no, which is crazy, right? Because, well, they long their exercise. But they think exercise is what you do after work. And they're just too tired after work to go to the gym. So all we did was take these chambermaids, divide it down into two groups, and we taught one group that their work was exercise. Because you have one group now that believes their work was exercise, another group that doesn't. We find they're not eating any differently, they're not working any harder, any differently. Nevertheless, in a short period of time, the group that now changed their minds about what was happening, changed their mindset, lost weight, there was a change in waist to hip ratio, body mass index, and their blood pressure. Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Happy Habit Podcast. I'm Matthew. On this podcast, I like to talk health, well-being, and self-improvement every Monday and Thursday. If you are new, welcome. If you're coming back, thank you very much for returning. And uh, you'll find us interviewing some of the world's leading experts in the fields of health, wellness, and self-improvement. I've recorded over 380 episodes so far. If you've enjoyed any of those episodes and you'd like to show some support to the podcast, well then please like, subscribe, share with friends and family, other people you think might get value from tuning in, and do leave the podcast a positive rating. It'll take you two seconds and is absolutely free. I believe we're up to 4.7 out of 5 now on Spotify. Speaking of Spotify, you'll also find videos of these interviews and these podcast episodes on Spotify now too. You'll find us on YouTube and on Instagram also. Now today I'm joined by Professor Ellen Langer. She is also known as the mother of mindfulness. She became the first woman to receive tenure in psychology at Harvard University. And she has spent the last 45 years engaged in researching mindlessness and mindfulness. She has published hundreds and hundreds of articles and best-selling books, including her latest, The Mindful Body. Her research and books focus on the illusion of control, mindful aging, stress, health and decision-making. She is very much a believer in the idea that the mind and body are unified and not separate as has been the conventional accepted concept underpinning Western medicine. In this episode, Professor Langer determines what she means when she uses the term mindfulness and how it differs from the concept that many people believe it to be. We hear what prompted her to study mindfulness in the first place. Throughout the interview, Professor Langer gives examples of the groundbreaking research she has performed over the years, including the now-famous counterclockwise study, which looked at what effects turning back the clock psychologically would have on an older adult's physiological state. We talk about the power of mindset, perception, and we hear about the impact mindset had on the physiology of chambermaids. Expect to learn why Professor Langer believes the mind and body are one entity and not separate. We hear about mindlessness and learn Professor Langer's thoughts on probability, the pointlessness of making predictions, and how best to make decisions. Professor Langer is a titan in the field of psychology. I was so lucky to have her on the podcast, and I really enjoyed this discussion. I hope you do too. Dr. Ellen Langer, author of The Mindful Body, absolute pleasure and privilege to meet with you, and thank you so much for agreeing to do this today. You are famous for being called the mother of mindfulness. It's a term that's bandied around an awful lot these days. But I want to find out at the outset what your definition of mindfulness is, because it certainly isn't being in the moment and it's not about meditation. 
Well, it certainly is being in the moment. What is? Uh, but it's about the way to be in the moment. You know, people tell you, be present, be in the moment. And it's sweet, but it's an empty in the structure. Because when you're not in the moment, you're not there to know you're not there. Right. So the way to be present is uh, to actively notice new things. It's so simple, it almost defies belief when you recognize all of the consequences that follow from this very simple process. Actively noticing. And what happens is that when you notice things about things you thought you knew, you come to see you didn't know them as well as you thought you did. Everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different perspectives, but we tend to hold them still. And, and everything in our world teaches us to be mindless, uh, unintentionally. You know, whenever you're looking for absolute facts, um, what you're doing is assuming that this information will stay the same across context. And even for the thing that people think they know most well, it's like, how much is one in one? So how much is one in one? We tell me. Well, uh, the the argument, the the normal mathematical argument would be with one and one equals two, but right. I presume and, and that... people. Well, and because you've heard me talk about this before, I'm going to have sure. to come up with a new example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I say to people, how many? And they all oh, they all know that it could be two, but it could also be one. If you add one cloud plus one cloud, one plus one is one. One pile of laundry plus one pile of laundry, one plus one. And as I argue in the real world, one plus one probably doesn't equal two as often as it does. But let's just imagine that after we're speaking today, somebody comes over to you and they say, Matthew, how much is one plus one? You're not going to mindlessly blurt out two and three more. You're going to pay attention to the context and you're going to answer more mindfully that it could be two. Now, the important thing to recognize is all the facts we've learned tend to ignore angels, you know, depending on context. And so I was a straight A student, the one you hate and you knew all the answers, right? But this was very important to me, a change for my life. I was at this horse event, and this person had asked me, would I watch his horse because he wanted to get his horse a hot dog? Well, I knew absolutely horses don't eat meat. I was taught horses are habitable. So I'm trying to be kind to him rather than snicker a little silly request. And I, I say, sure, I'll watch your horse. He goes, he gets the, the hot dog, he comes back, and the horse ate it. And when I realized everything I thought I knew could be wrong. And in fact, the students who didn't do as well in class were probably better that night because they hadn't learned all of these false absolutes. But so now many people would be upset when they find out everything they know could be wrong. I'm bizarre, I know this. To me, I was very excited because it meant that everything that I thought couldn't be, maybe could be. So it's, it was exciting to me to think that all of the things that people think can't be, possibly could be. And you know, e even if you take something like brain damage, where people for so long believed, um, that's it. You know, Once the brain is damaged, and uh, the game is over. I thought, well, how can we know that? Why couldn't parts of the brain regenerate? Why couldn't um, um, parts that were not damaged take over the part, you know, the uh, the function of those that were? And you know, and that would lead me if I had brain damage, which some may say I did, <laughs> um, you know, to, to proceed differently rather than just give up. Um, so let me you know, go back to your original question. Let me go in circles and. And, uh, hopefully it'll all be clear by the end. But you said, so what is mindfulness as I study it? And I've said that it's actively noticing uh, new things about the things you think you know. And then you realize you didn't know them as well as you thought you did. And your attention naturally goes there. Now, another way for this to come about is to recognize that we don't know anything. And since so many of us pretend we know everything, um, this is a harder thing to grasp. But if you do this, noticing the things you think you know often enough to see you don't know them, you come eventually to the conclusion that everything is potentially new. Everything can be understood in multiple ways. So you start off with the idea, which I 
which is uncertainty is the rule. It's not the exception. It has to be the rule because things can be understood in so many ways, things are changing, and it's our minds that hold them still. And uh, this opens up again for me enormous possibility. So um, many, many years ago, we did research where we made people more mindful, older people, and they live longer. And um, so that was kind of strange to me. How do you get from this fuzzy thing called a thought to something material for the body? And the world didn't tell me. Now, everybody out there believed in mind-body uh, dualism. You have a mind, you have a body. And to me, all I wanted to know is what, how are they connected? And then I realized, because I didn't accept that everything I had been taught had been correct, and mind, body, these are just words. What if we put the mind and body back together and see it as a single thing? Well, then, wherever you're putting the mind, you're necessarily putting the body. And that opens up enormous control for us. People believe that, for example, when they have chronic illness, what they take that to mean is they have no control over it. There's nothing that can be done. Well, it turns out science can't prove that um, nothing can be done. Science can only show you that what you tried didn't work. Right? And science only gives us probabilities, maybes, not absolutes. Now, if you put the mind and body back together, when you have one of these chronic illnesses and your mind is in a healthy place, what we find is um, eventually your body uh, is also in that place. We've done many, many studies. Let me give you an example so people have a flavor for what I'm talking about. Way back when um, we did the original study, which is called the counterclockwise study. Now, uh, not that I can tell you, this is a famous study, not being among us, because uh, if you watch The Simpsons go to Havana, they actually talk about the study. Right. So what we did was to retrofit a retreat to 20 years earlier. And we had elderly men live there as if they were their younger selves. So they spoke about past events in the present tense and so on. So in all ways, we put the mind back to that earlier time. As a result of this, in just a week, their hearing improved, their vision improved, their strength, their memory, and they looked younger. Now, you know, think about it. Uh, prior to that, I had never heard of an older person's hearing improving without any medical intervention. And there was no medical intervention that could uh, improve hearing except, you know, the use of a hearing aid and so on. So this is kind of remarkable. And again, saying, well, why do we believe that as you get older, you just fall apart? Um, and we expect that. And so as we, in some sense, see ourselves falling apart, we don't do anything about it. A, a, a simple example of this is, you know, let's say you're 20 years old and your wrist hurts. Well, people don't believe that at 20 they're falling apart. So they do something to make their wrist stronger. But if, you're, if you were brought up believing as you get older, the game is over. All you do is get worse and worse. And, you know, then your wrist hurts. You say, yeah. I mean, so that's life, but, you know, I'm old and this is going to happen. So you don't take that simple step. And then eventually what happens is the 20-year-old's riffs is falling and yours isn't. But that doesn't mean it couldn't have been if way back when it first started to hurt, you took some steps. So that's separate from, you know, the simple idea of a mind-body unity um, that speaks to the issue of control. Let me just give you a, two more examples. We have so many in the mindful body. I have so many studies on this mind-body unity. Each one, I think, um, itself is interesting. But the next in this series, I won't go through all of them, was with chambermaids. Okay, so it turns out, if you um, ask chambermaids, do they get any exercise? They say no, which is crazy, right? Because all day long, they're exercising. But they think exercise is what you do afterwards. And they're just too tired after work to go to the gym. So all we did was take these chambermaids, divided them into two groups, and we taught one group that their work was exercise. Because you have one group now that believes their work is exercise, another group that doesn't. 
We find they're not eating any differently. They're not working any harder, any differently. Nevertheless, in a short period of time, the group that now changed their minds about what was happening, changed their mindset, lost weight. There was a change in waist to hip ratio, body mass index, and their blood pressure. Simply from changing the room. Let me give you, we'll skip all the ones in between, which were so interesting, I, I thought. So the last one we did, we take, um, we inflict a wound, minor wound, because we're not sadists. <laughs> and even if we were, the review groups wouldn't let us uh, do that to people. So we inflict a minor wound, and we have three groups of people. Unbeknownst to them, the clock in front of them is rigged. So for a third of the people, they're watching a clock that's going twice as fast as real time. For a third of the people, they're watching a clock that's going half as fast as real time. In the third group, it's real time. And the question we're asking is, does that wound heal based on clock time in real time, which is what most people would assume, or our perception of the passage? And it turns out that the wound heals based on perceived. We have people in a sleep lab, they wake up, they see the clock, they think they got two hours more sleep than they got, two hours fewer, or the amount of sleep they got. Again, biological and cognitive functions follow perceived sleep. Um, you know, a study is like this, um, and we have lots of evidence from other areas of, of work that we've done uh, that show this learning body unit is a, 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 a meaningful way of understanding ourselves that again yields enormous control. So let's say you and I take an IQ test and you get a 70, which is means you're normal, and I get a 69, which means I'm nervous, I'm cognitively deficient. Now you don't have to be a statistician to know that there's no meaningful difference between our scores. 69, 70, I couldn't sneeze, misread the question, a, a, a number of things. But now you're in the normal group, I'm in the troubled group. If we come back to us and give us tests, let's say three months later, the first we start off, we're not different, but because of a label, we now organize ourselves and get differently, engage in different activities, and so on, um, down the road, I will be cognitively deficient while you stay in the room. So if we do this now, we call this the borderline effect, and we do it with a disease that, you know, before the medical world can declare you have a disease, they give you all sorts of tests. So, and no matter how many tests and how they put these, the answers to this test together, you get some people who just at the border line are told they have the disease and those right beneath them are told they don't have. So they're the same at the start. But what we find is down the road, and not that far down, the road, let's say with diabetes, so it would be true with any disease, they split apart. And those who are given the diagnosis manifest the symptoms of the disease. Um, it's, you know, it's remarkable. Um, there's so much that was exciting to me in writing this book and uh, realizing what we can control, not, not just our health, I mean, everything about ourselves. And when you think of mind-body unity, that says not just we can control our bodies, but everything our bodies do is affecting our movements. Um, you want to ask me a question? <laughs> what about the machine? Now you ask one question and I go on. Oh, no, no. That's, that's what these interviews are all about. It's great to hear you talk in depth. Reading this book, actually, particularly the, the parts in, uh, involving healing reminded me of, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Jeff Rediger. Uh, he's a, a psychiatrist. Yeah. Sure. yeah, sure, uh, yeah. And he wrote... He, he wrote a terrific book a few years ago called Cured, where he looked basically at people's yeah. uh, perception. Yeah, spontaneous their... remission. Yeah, exactly. Spontaneous remission and placebo effect and all of that. And it, 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 feeds, in, it feeds from the same source in that people's perception of themselves and their illness and their optimism can actually give rise to these yeah. incredible uh, cures. Well, what seem well, to be cures. Yeah. 
you know, the the idea of mind body unity actually explains spontaneous remission. So let me tell you a personal story that dictated lots of my research for the next many decades. Uh, my mother had um, breast cancer. She was 50, well, 55, I think, when she got it. And um, the cancer had metastasized to her pancreas. So that's the end wing, right? And so the medical world just wrote her off. Uh, she's in bed and they're not exercising her legs or anything because after all, they're expecting any moment she's going to die. Then magically, it was gone. And the medical world couldn't explain it. And that was part of why I did the research I did over the next several decades was in order to explain it. And I think that, I don't remember just what Jeff said, but the spontaneous remissions are seen as um, rare. And I think that probably not. You know, if you imagine uh, that you have some disease or whatever, and you're supposed to die, and you decide you want to die you know, in your own home, in your own bed, and then whatever you have goes away. I don't think the first thing you're going to do is call your doctor and say, ha ha, and you are wrong. So the medical world doesn't get that information. And then you have all the people uh, in remote places who have tumors. They don't even know they have tumors, and the tumor goes away. Um, we have no idea how um, uh, likely spontaneous remission actually is. And from my perspective and my work, um, it seems to me one is always better off presuming that, in fact, whatever they have can go away. Um, and that, and the reason for that, you know, you can still make a will and do and you know, take care of those things in case you die. I mean, she, when people have died, people should do that anyway, perhaps. But my feeling is, as long as you're alive, you should be living. And too many of us are sealed in unlived lives. You know, so that I get calls all the time from people who were just diagnosed with some dread disease and they're angry and they're depressed. And, you know, and what I say to them, among other things, is that if it were I and I thought that I had, let's say, three weeks to live, I don't think I would waste my time being angry or depressed. Um, first thing I do is I go have a hot fudge Sunday and then you know, just uh, go about living as much as I could. Now, the advantage of this, which I said at the very beginning, but probably not clearly, enough, is that if I'm going about living and I'm mindful and taking in new things, I'm enjoying myself, the neurons are firing, and decades of our work shows that that's actually literally and figuratively enlivening. So by doing the full living, you're helping yourself. But even if you weren't, you know, um, I think people, people are spending a lot of time now because there are so many baby boomers and people older trying to add more uh, years to their lives. And what I recommend instead is add more light to your years. And that will probably also uh, work to extend your life. And how do you add this light? Simply by knowing you don't know. And then everything is potentially exciting. And it's very different from meditation, which is fine, which is different. Now, when you meditate, what you do is close yourself off of the world, sit quietly for 20 minutes twice a day. And that often leads to post-meditative room. Meditation itself is a room. For us, it's in the media. And it doesn't require practice. And it's effortless. So if you were going to visit me in my home, you've never been here before, you wouldn't have to practice anything. You'd walk in and you'd say, oh, yeah, she did she do that painting? What books is she reading? Why is there a tennis racket here? If you would just know this, and it would be fun. And that's why vacations are fun. We're spending money to enjoy ourselves, so we you know, look for new things. So just to say, um, when I say to people, we should be mindful all the time, they shudder. It sounds exhausting, except being mindful is what you're doing when you're having the most fun. So it's so easy, and um, you know, just some of the consequences. It's not just that you're healthier, you're happier, you're seen as more charismatic. The things you do end up bearing the imprint of your mindfulness. 
it there's no downside and so many upsides. It's interesting. You'll probably agree with this, but I've heard uh, other people say that the the whole uh, reality or notion that life seems to move faster when we get older is based on the fact that we experience fewer novelties as we get older, as opposed to when we're younger, when those years, three, four, five, six years of age, when everything is new, everything is novel. And life seems to move a lot slower when we're younger because we're exposed to all those new experiences and they make an impression on us. Um, yes, but, you know, when you're having fun, uh, time goes by very quickly. And when you're bored um, or stressed true, true. or unhappy, it seems to, to be endless. And you're only bored, stressed, or unhappy as a result of mindlessness. So, uh, and I think that as you get older, many people become naturally more mindful. You know, you, you've you experienced so many things that you see, it's not such a big deal, right? You know, that you and I have a fight. Okay, so you're young, um, you worry, are we going to make up? How is it going to affect your life? So on and so forth. Um, you get to be my age, you've had fights, you've had good times, bad. You see, it's it's just nothing. You know, and it's sort of as you get older, you know, you're two, I wrote something about this years ago. You're two years old and you fall and you scrape your knee and you're screaming bloody murder as if the world's going to end. And then you're in elementary school and it's Valentine's Day and Johnny or Janie doesn't send you a Valentine. Oh my God, you, you can't bear it, right? And, you know, and then you're a little older, you're an adolescent and you get a pimple. And yet no one is going to ever care about you. You're never going to be attracted. You know, and it just, you know, then you get to a point where, you know, you know that most of these things are transient. Most of them don't matter. Most of them even have an upside. Um, and that all allows you to be more positive and warmer. Going back to medical diagnoses, I know you're not a fan at all of probability, particularly when it comes to uh, giving somebody, for example, who presents with uh, stage four cancer, giving them the diagnosis that they only have six months left to live. You're not a fan of that at all. Well, it's, you know, it's not that I'm not a fan of probability. I mean, I'm, you know, probability is as good as any other discipline. Um, what I have spent a lot of time trying to make people understand is that most of the things that we've learned were just probabilities. Science only gives you a probability. It says that if you were to repeat this exact same experiment, the same way, which you can never do exactly, but let's assume you could, that means you're likely to get this result. That's often translated in textbooks by physicians, parents, teachers as absolute. So it's not most horses under these circumstances don't eat meat. You learn horses don't eat meat. You learn this disease is incurable. You learn things that um, the data uh, shouldn't permit us to learn because they're saying maybe. Now, if you knew that you had something, you might have it, and it might not be uh, cured um, in standard ways versus you do have it, and it's incurable. I, I think a you know, normal person would orient themselves differently. If I want to do something and the world tells me it can't be done, many people are just not going to do it. If I want to do something and the world says, well, we don't think it will work, you know, then you say, well, why not try? And so that this is the approach we've taken, and we have incredible findings with um, lots of so-called uh, chronic illnesses. The word chronic, for example, just means that the medical world doesn't know how to fix it. It doesn't mean that there's nothing that we could do. Now, I came to this just recently. It's it, mind-boggling for me that it took me so long, but I spent all this time since 1979, before that, um, trying to get people to appreciate mind-body unity. And only the other day, I realized People don't even appreciate body unity, that you're one body. You know, so that means if you hurt your arm and there's nothing that can be done for your arm, but since it's one body, if you build up the rest of you, that's certainly going to make your arm stronger. And then, you know, a little thought experiment. Let's say 
um, you compare an Olympic athlete with a couch potato. Couch potato gets no exercises, eating all the wrong things, and so on. All right. And you expose both of them, let's say, to COVID. I don't think they'd be equally likely to get it, but let's assume they both got it. I don't think their experience of it would be the same, even though at, you know, let's say at the time, we didn't have any cure for COVID. So what I'm saying to make it clearer mm. is that there's always something that we can do. And, and knowing that turns out itself to be good for our health because when we believe we're helpless, again, the system starts to turn itself off because we become more mindful. You know, if you don't think there's anything to pay attention to, the system's turning itself off. If you believe, you know, what you are um, uh, maybe out there, then you keep yourself busy looking for. Can we talk about another subject in the book, and that is the subject of predictions? Uh, can you speak to me about? Uh... I can. You know, this one is more complicated, um, but people believe that they can predict. Now, the medical world believes they can predict because they take these probabilities and make them absolute facts. So in the example you gave me before, that doctor should be shot, maybe you know, literally, but you know, for saying you have six muscles, so there is no way of knowing. You know, let's go back to the you know, start for me. You know, my mother was not supposed to live, you know, another two weeks. And then the cancer is gone. They don't know. So probabilities, when they're um, made into absolutes, we make predictions based on them that we shouldn't. Okay, so now, in a more general way, people are very good at postdicting. What I mean by that, it, it, the common expression, <laughs> excuse me, is Monday morning quarterbacking. After the fact, it's very easy to draw a line to show, oh, it had to be. Going forward, we have no idea. So let's say you and I are at a party, and we see Susan and Peter fight it. And at that moment, I said to you, Matthew, are they going to be divorced? You'd probably say, who knows? How can you predict? Sometimes people fight. But let's say we don't have that conversation. Now, a week later after the party, I say, Matthew, you know, Peter and Susan are getting divorced. I knew it. You should have seen the way they were fighting. All right. So going forward, we don't know. Looking back, um, we make it seem that you could have or should have known. Now, science uh, can predict for the group, which is very different from predicting the individual case. So let's say um, you are going to bet all your money. I'm going to have a foul shooting contest with Michael Jordan. Okay. Now, if we shoot lots of baskets, surely he's going to win. However, would you wait, put all of your teacher earnings and whatever you have invested at the moment, that at this moment, when he shoots that foul shot, and I shoot it, that he's going to room. He sometimes misses, I sometimes get it in. A different example that I've used a lot. Let's say we go to a Mercedes dealership. You have 100 cars. Now, if we say we're going to you know, start them, most of them are going to start up right away as soon as you turn the key. They're a good car. That's what people are paying a lot of money. But would you again bet your life savings that any of the, let's say, 100 cars, uh, cars that we chose at random would start as soon as you turn the key? Let's say probably not because there are lemons, right? You know, not, not everything is perfect. Not every perfect car is perfect. Not every perfect athlete is perfect. You know, and so on. And so the point is that while we can predict for the group, people mistakenly think we can predict for the individual case. So um, let's say we know most people who take this drug get better. That doesn't mean if you're given this drug, you'll get that. Most people whose cancer has gotten to this point don't live beyond six months does not mean they can heal yourself for only one or six weeks. You understand? You know, so, um, and really when it comes down to our health, our individual lives, all we really care about primarily is us. You know, it's nice if most people like this thing, but will I like it if I do? You know, I, I learned this when I was a kid. 
And I remember being dissuaded from taking chemistry because, you know, all the people I know, oh, it's hard, you know. It was my favorite course. You know, if you if any of us think about the ways we're different from other people, those are the examples of not being able to, oh, here's one that may persuade people. If you go shopping, you go food shopping. Okay, what you're doing is trying to predict what you're going to want to eat for the week. And how many things you end up throwing out um, at the end of the week. All of those were mispredictions. A fun story for me, uh, my ex-husband, when you know, very young, now he was in the army, I took ROTC, I think, to avoid Vietnam, but whatever. So he's in the army, and I go to a commissary. This was before, I believe, things like Costco, BJ's, you know, these Sam's Club, these discount places exist. And I love the bargain. So I go into the commissary and I buy, because we're going to leave soon, this tour is over. I'm going to buy all the stockings in the kingdom. Because in the commissary, they were half the price I mean, in the stores back home. Okay, I buy, I, mean, I didn't have that much money, so it wasn't that sort of that. But I bought many of these to save money. Two weeks after we were home, pantyhose team. I don't know if this is a woman's thing, but you realize when pantyhose was invented, people stopped wearing stockings. Okay, so you know, I bought all these things for you know, thinking that it will be good forever. You know, um, and English. What a, yeah, prediction is an illusion. Um, and, uh, uh, well, uh, where do you want me to take this? Because I can go in many places. Well, I, I was just going to ask you if... Uh, predictions are part of the anatomy of making a decision yeah. what is the rela- what is the relationship between predictions and indecision and not making a decision yeah well okay so decision making I mean, uh, is another thing that I think we've got all wrong and we have all these decisions there and most people believing that you should do some kind of cost benefit analysis to decide what to do so you have let's say two outcomes here the advantage of um, and when you think about it deeply, it makes no sense to do a cost-benefit analysis. I'll get to prediction in a minute, because each cost is potentially a benefit. Each benefit is a cost. Benefits, costs, good, bad, are in our head. They're not in events. So if I said to you, do you want to meet my friend Susie? She's very impulsive. We decide no. If I said to you, do you want to meet my friend Susie? She's very spontaneous. You'd say yes. Impulsive and spontaneous are the same thing. Do you want to meet Ellen? She's very gullible. No, no. Do you want to meet Ellen? She's very trusting. Yeah. Okay, so if every good is bad and every bad is good, can be seen, then you can add them up to tell you what to do. Now, when you're looking at trying to decide um, between two things. Let's say, should I go to Paris or should I go to Rome? Uh, you're making a prediction that the time you were last, let's say, in Paris will feel the same as now. And the time you were in Rome would feel the same as now. Or what people say would be the same. You're predicting, um, and we've just said prediction is an illusion. Okay, so... The third part about decision making, that's crazy thinking, is that people think they should take in information to pull apart the alternatives. But nobody tells you how much information you should consider. And any new piece could change the decision. So, should I go to Paris or um, Rome? If I've never been to either case, for me, psychologically, they're the same. And if I said to you, Matthew, do you want A or B? You wouldn't spend a lot of time thinking about it, right? What is A? What is B? All right? So if the alternatives are the same, it makes no difference. And as soon as you uh, see the ways the alternatives are different, let's say you find out A is $100 and B is $10,000, there's no calculation. You're just going to take the $10,000. So it's it's so different from what people think they should be doing, what people are told to do, that I'm sure you know people have to read the book 
to fully understand this, but let me give people the bottom line, and then you can ask me to clarify something that was not so cool. I say, rather than waste your time trying to make the right decision, which you can't predict, because good and bad is you know, um, the uh, um, essence of you know, choice in your head, not in the outcomes, um, that rather than waste your time trying to make the right decision, make the decision right. So I, in my classes, decision-making classes, I'd have people, I said, spend the week now not making any decision. Use some random little um, game to yourself. You flip a coin or decide you're always going to do the first thing that comes to mind. And then next week we'll discuss how it felt. And they come back the next week. And it was a wonderful week because it was stress-free. Because decision-making is stressful for most people. Right. So if you want to decide, should you take this job or this job? There's no way to know. There's no way to know how the job is going to be experienced by you. Should I have children or should I not have children? You can't live a life first with children and live a life without children and then say, ah, oh, that one was better, whichever. Right? So as soon as you're making a decision, you make a decision to t behave differently, to, you know, to, to um, go forward in life. And as soon as you do that, it changes the equation. You can't experience both of the things. Or you, know, you have two choices. You can't experience both of them and then figure out which one is back. So it's always um, a, a guess. But you can always, always control your experience of whatever the decision is. Well, this then allows us to foster a right. much healthier relationship with regret then, doesn't it? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you for asking it. That regret suggests that you could have known. You know, so let's say you're making a decision um, to, should I go to Harvard or Yale? And you decide to go to Yale and you don't like it. So then some people, oh, damn, I should have gone to Harvard. The implication is that going to Harvard would have been better. Uh, it could have been worse. It could have been the same. Um, you know, that, and whatever we decide, now this is a, an important piece that often gets lost for people. We make a decision, whether we, we do it by uh, this random method, whatever it is, but we do something because it makes sense to us or else we wouldn't do. If we're not aware of why we're doing that, then later, when there seems to be some consequence as a result of doing it, we take ourselves to task. How can I have been so stupid to have done this? Um, and it's again as if we could have um, the consequences at the beginning. Um, so, you know, it's interesting because I'm saying we can't know um, and the important piece is to recognize we don't need to know. Once you recognize that, let's say, stress, stress is not a function of events. Stress is a function of the view you take of an event. If you're mindful and you see this can be understood in so many ways, um, you know, there's always an advantage to it. And so, you know, so let's say with us right now, we're speaking. I'm having a good time. And let's say all of a sudden the internet goes out. I'll still have a good time. Then I'll, you know, I'll go eat lunch, you know, which I'll enjoy. Um, no matter what happens, there's a way to enjoy it. We're not a victim from our circumstances. And then while we realize that we can control our experience of things, we don't need to control them um, in the same way. If you think, I have to have this because otherwise I'm going to be miserable or I can't get involved in that because it's going to be awful, um, then we're stressed, uh, not realizing the experience of it being miserable or wonderful is essentially in our hands. Okay, so, let, so let's break it down then to, to brass tacks, as they say. On a day-to-day -day basis then, because you, you have said that most people actually go through lives 
in a mindlessness way. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're not even aware that they're doing this, uh, uh, living mindlessless, mindlessly. Um, how can we, on a day-to-day basis, uh, from hour to hour, live more mindfully? Okay, so it's easy when you're learning something new. Because the way to learn it is not, yes, is the way to do it, but rather this is one way. You know, so if you learn this is the way and then you get older, or let's say you're playing tennis and you break your arm, then you can't do it that way. Most people would think then you can't play. For me, when I hurt my arm, I started playing with my other hand. You know, the, um, so it's, I've just gotten myself lost. Um, so the, the way to uh, be mindful, so what I'm saying is when you're learning something new, learn it mindful. Learn that there are many ways you can do it. Um, pull the tennis room, you know, whatever it is you're doing. Okay. But how do you change all the mindlessness that um, we've already been taught? And uh, it's very hard. Um, my book um, on becoming an artist uh, deals with it, uh, but I think the maybe the first thing is for people whenever they're unhappy, whenever they're experiencing the regret we talked about, whenever they're embarrassed, whenever they're fearful, those are the times we start paying attention uh, to ourselves, and at those moments we can open it up more broadly and just ask yourself. How else might it be? You know, when you're stressed, most people don't stop and think about things, but stress requires two things. First, it requires a prediction that something's going to happen. And we've just said we can't predict. Second is the belief that when it happens, it's going to be off. Okay, so you're stressed. Now ask yourself, this thing that you're so worried about, what are five reasons that may not even happen? And you immediately feel better. And it turns out, Matthew, that most of the things people worry about never happen. And what you can do is ask yourself the last thing you were stressed about. Did it end up happening? And if it happened, was it terrible? And the answer is almost always going to be no. So if, if you look at past how you dealt with these things, it gives us some information going forward. But now, the more interesting part, I find, is let's assume this, quote, terrible thing does happen. How is it actually advantage? You know, so you're stressed that the person you're with is going to leave you. Well, that's a killer for you know for most of us. But you must realize, most, you know, it would be good to realize that a relationship requires two people. And if the other person isn't there, you're in a terrible relationship to start. So the loss is not so good. You know, and that means that then you'd be free to get into a more meaningful relationship with somebody else. Okay, so what I'm saying is when you're stressed, you say to yourself, why might this thing not even happen? You feel better. If it happens, what are the advantages? You feel better. And if you know you feel better, if it happens, it doesn't happen. You know, if we were together and back you and I'd say, you want to say, where do I want to have dinner? I don't care. I'm going to enjoy myself no matter what. What movie do we want to say? I don't care. I'm going to enjoy it no matter what. You end up so powerful as soon as you realize you're not a victim of circumstances. Um, and that's what so much of this book is about, is how everything out there is mutable. Everything out there can be changed by us. But we have to recognize that, um, that this is the case, you know, um, and I, I speak oftentimes to, um, to women in this regard, because if I, you know, let's say I'll, I'll be giving a lecture and at this point I'll ask, I'll look in the audience, is there a really tall man or a really tall person? There's almost always, for some reason, a six foot five. I invite him up to the stage. So there I am at five, three standing next to him, right? We look silly, right? And then I simply raise the question, should we do anything the same way? It doesn't seem like we should because we're so different. The example I often use, and I don't know if this is a good one or not, but imagine we're both sitting on the same toilet, not at the same time, but 
biologically, one of us is not getting our needs met. So the point here is, the more different you are from the person who designed the activity, the more important it is to realize uh, you can do it in a different way uh, from that person. And that everything we learn should be, yeah, this is one way, there are other ways of doing. And, um, uh, and that leads us to feel better about ourselves, to, um, uh, to have more successes. Um, and it's the same thing with our health. The medical world says this is the case. We need to translate that as this is also the case. You know, the uh, sports world says this is the way you hold the tennis racket. Um, if you're not 6'5 and your hand is not as large, you should hear as, well, this is one way of holding the two strings and amend things so that it works better for us so we can better meet our own needs. Well, as you've been uh, talking there, I was just thinking that one of your central beliefs, and you outline this in, in the book also, is that, and we've spoken about it already, is that the mind and body are unified. And I'm just uh, curious that you, you mentioned there the, the medical world. Are we any closer to them accepting that philosophy going yeah. forward? Okay, so it's interesting. Not that many years ago, I want to say a couple of decades ago, the medical model believes that psychology was irrelevant to disease. You know, I'm sure doctors and nice people want you to be happy, but that was just separate from uh, your physical health. And the way you were going to become sick was only with the introduction of an antigen, pathogen. Now, people, most medical people, believe how psychology matters, and there's study after study that comes out to show you how stress is bad, you know, bad for your health. Um, so yes, people, I'm sure there are still die, some diehards who believe um, mind, you know, mind and body um, are distinct and the mind has no effect over the body. But I'd say most believe they're related, but by not seeing them as one, you end up with the problem. How do you get from this fuzzy thing called the thought to something material called the body? And so they're not likely to recommend psychological treatments. Now, uh, as you know from the book, we, we have this uh, treatment for all sorts of chronic diseases that I call attention to symptom variability. And that's just a fancy way of saying being mindful. When you're mindful, you're noticing change. And as soon as most of us are given a diagnosis for some chronic illness, we don't think there's going to be any change except things will get worse. So it's either going to stay the same or get worse. But, you know, nothing moves in only one direction. You know, when the stock market is um, doing well, it doesn't go up in a straight line, right? It goes up and it goes down a little, it goes up, you know, same thing when it's full, right? So when, uh, when you realize that your symptoms are changing, which now you might pay attention to and you weren't before, you can ask the question, well, why? Why now is this a little better or a little worse? Okay, so we take people who have uh, chronic illnesses, and we're going to ask them, we're going to call them periodically in the course of a week and ask them, how is the symptom now? Is it better or worse than before? And why? That's the important question. Because by asking why, First of all, you're going to do a mindful search of potential one is why now is you now I'm not hurt, it, you know, because I had Cheerios for breakfast and who knows. But each of these is mindful. Mindfulness itself is good for you. And finally, if you're looking for a cure, you're more likely, I should to find. Okay, so, well, you know, imagine that um, you are very stressed really, and we're, you're doing this attention to variability and you think you're always stressed. Nobody is always anything. This is the point of this, right? But the, when you're not stressed, you're not thinking about your stress. So that's how you end up thinking you're always stressed, is every time you're thinking about it. Now, you call it every day. How is the stress right now? Is it better or worse than the last time we spoke throughout the day, throughout the week? And you just discover, you know, when you're talking to Ellen Lang, that's when you experience the most stress. 
Okay, so as soon as you have that realization, you have the cure, right? Stop talking to me or talk to me differently. So we take people who have arthritis, chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, a host of real things. We call them several times during the day. We ask them, is whatever the symptom, is it better or worse than before and why? And we get remarkable effects across all diseases. Um, and the good thing about this is that there's no negative side effects. So you try this and what happens is, you know, when you have a chronic illness, lots of people just feel helpless and helplessness is bad for your health. But even if it weren't, it wants to feel helpless. So now you're back in control. Maybe there's something you can do. Uh, the doing of it ends up feeling good because it's mindful and mindfulness is, you know, the essence of engagement, what's what we're doing when when we're happy, um, and you very well may find um, a cure. If you don't mind me saying, you seem to be the living embodiment of all of the, the learning that you've taken from your experiments down through the years. You have such a healthy and positive outlook to life. Does thank you for that. I, and I, you know, I was told that I marked the edge of the optimism continuum. Um, but people need to realize that you know, the optimist, this is the way the world is. It's not that, you know, I'm seeing, you know, uh, and pessimists think that, no, it's all awful. I think that if you have the choice, it's much, if you see a glass as half empty, you spend your time being thirsty, worrying about, you know, the effects, it's, negative effects it's going to have on you. If you see the glass as half full, you go about living. And in that living, you'll probably find another source of water. Um, so, yeah, now I, but in, there's something that uh, is a little backward. People often ask me, um, you know, have any of these you know, very extreme, I'd say, effects of some of my research changed my life? And you would think it would, except by and large, um, it's my life that dictates the thought in the first place. So an example, one that's the most fun for the mind body. I was, uh, this book, by the way, The Mindful Body, started off as a memoir. So there are lots of personal stories, one of which is um, I was married when I was very young and we went to Paris on our honeymoon. So now I was 19 going on 30. There is the skin the woman of the world. We go to dinner and I order a mixed grill. Um, among the things that's going to come on the plate is pancreas. I don't think I can eat it, but now that I'm so sophisticated, I think for some bizarre reason, I have to eat any married woman, any adult. So it comes. My then husband was more sophisticated than I. Um, and I asked him which of these things on the plate was the pancreas and he pointed to something. So I ate everything else with gusto. Now the moment of truth. Can I eat the pancreas? I start eating that and I literally get sick. He starts laughing. And I say, why are you laughing? He said, because that's chicken. You ate the pancreas a while ago. <laughs> so very, 19 years old, I saw how you can make yourself sick. Then at, let's say, 28 years old, I saw how one could be diagnosed with um, uh, pancreatic cancer and how it can magically you know, disappear. So I pay attention to bizarre as much as I can in my life that you know, interests to me. And then I say, is this true only for me? Am I misunderstanding it? And then I put it in a study to see if there's a more general truth to say it. Well, I can tell you the book is a great read. It's full of life lessons, to be honest with you. So I'd recommend it for anybody. Uh, it is called The Mindful Body. Dr. Ellen Langer, absolute privilege to have you on the podcast. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, well, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Happy Habit Podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please like, subscribe, share with other people who you think might enjoy tuning in also, and leave the podcast a positive rating because it does help show support for the channel and helps spread the message of what we're trying to do on this podcast. Until next time, stay happy. Mm -hmm.